I just want to start by saying, um, listening to the speakers this morning has really helped um, put an angle on, on today. And it's extremely clear that everyone in the room, we all want the same thing. We all want the best outcomes for children, young people and the adults um, that we work with around safeguarding. Um, and that's really, really evident. And I've always believed that. You know, sometimes you get clashes, don't you, with um, various statutory agencies. Um, but overall, everybody wants the same thing and everybody's working to the same thing and we are no different. Um, so thank you for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to start by looking at some of the work that we've done, um, which is around investigating into child homicides that were specifically related to domestic abuse. Um, 20 years ago, uh, we did a big piece of research looking at children who'd gone through the family courts where their contact um, had been uh, at, for contact and the outcome had been a homicide, unfortunately. Um, I want to take you through them just to give you a feel for the type of work that Women's Aid do. Um, so you can see there, I don't know whether you can hear me if I move away from this microphone, um, that there were two lots of investigations and the one that we did, which was the 19 child homicides, was more recently. And what we decided to do was revisit um, the last investigations that were done because from the last investigations that were done which was the 29 child homicide in 2004 um, there were some recommendations made and those one of those recommendations was to change um, practice direction 12j which is what the, the family judges um, look at uh, when they're dealing with domestic abuse cases and we went through a further 19 child homicides that had happened in the last decade. This particular report was met very well um, by Sir James Mumby and he said that he would look into our findings and from that he made some specific changes again to practice direction 12J. Now some of you in the room might be very well aware of this but some of you may not and I think it's important that we understand what we're dealing with. But first of all I'll take you through those cases. So there were 19 children that we looked at and they were all killed by a parent who was a known perpetrator of domestic abuse. During that time, two mothers were also killed within those families by the father of the children, and seven fathers committed suicide, and there was one attempted suicide as well. Uh, two more children were seriously physically harmed, so that was classed as attempted murder. All 12 fathers were known to statutory agencies as perpetrators of domestic abuse. Um, and for 12 in the seven families of the 19 killed, contact with the perpetrator, their father, was arranged in the court. And why I'm bringing this to light really is because in those cases, the mothers of those children had fought not to have contact, saying that they genuinely believed that their children um, would come to harm if they were given contact. So lots of considerations here. Uh, one of the main things that came out was that there wasn't a recognition, uh, recognition that domestic abuse was actually harmful to children. Now, I'm sure everybody in the room here knows that domestic abuse can harm children uh, to varying degrees. But there was also a really concerning perception that fathers who committed domestic abuse were not necessarily seen as a risk to their children. Um, and as we go further on, you'll see what I'm meaning here. One of those reasons was that we're seeing parental separation um, not as a risk factor, when in actual fact, the separation time where there's domestic abuse is the most dangerous time. So it's the time when most homicides occur and when women are more seriously, uh, seriously injured as well. So it's on the point of leaving and post-separation that is the most dangerous time. Nine out of those 12 perpetrators were known to have committed post-separation abuse. And I'm going to show you something uh, a bit later on where you'll see the connection to this, so remember that. And um, There was actually one case where a father was granted residential care of the children. And this was after he'd made threats by telephone whilst he was in prison. So there is a link there to be made because we work with quite a few women whose partners carry on 
threatening them whilst they're in prison and actually very little gets done, that connection isn't necessarily made. Um, the statutory agency's perception was that perpetrators change after the relationship ends. Perpetrators don't change after the relationship ends. In fact, they become even more obsessed with taking back that control that has been lost during that relationship. So we've got to remember that domestic abuse is actually about someone controlling someone in a relationship. Once that relationship ends, that control is lost. And some perpetrators will go to extremes to find their partners and create as much damage um, as they can. One of the examples that I give of that is that when I worked in the North, you might have gathered that I've got a Northern accent and that I'm from Hull. Um, and one of our Doncaster refuges had to be closed down. And the reason it had to be closed down was because it, uh, there was a woman in there with three children who had fled from London. Um, so we have a huge network of refugees throughout the country so we can accommodate children f and women fleeing from one area to another. This particular case, she did have some relatives in, Do in the Doncaster area so she moved to Doncaster and went into the refuge before she was going to be rehoused. Her partner worked for BT and he tried lots of different ways actually to find her and initially what he did was he reported her as a missing person which for those of you that are aware is actually quite common per separation so he reported her as a, a missing person he then went for a seek and find order because he went to a solicitor and said that his wife had left him he wasn't seeing his children he was extremely upset and he had no idea where they were and as a last resort uh, when he found out that she'd been sighted in the Doncaster area from a friend of a relative in the area, he, had, he, he asked his friend at BT, who had access to information, um, if he could look up the address of the refuge. Now, what he actually said to that friend was, oh, she's always lying, she's always saying that I've done this, I've done that, and my guess is that she's in some, one of those women's refuges somewhere. Um, and the addresses of refuges, as, as everyone knows, I'm sure, in this room, are not publicly known so they're not they're not they it's just the numbers that are there and he looked the address up for her and for him and that the next day he went to that refuge in the early evening seven eight o'clock and with with some mates and he created havoc at the front of the refuge he got all his friends to bang and hammer on the door and shout and whilst they were doing that he broke in at the back of the refuge so he broke into the refuge and he stabbed that woman to death in front of all the women and children that were there in the refuge. So we've always got to remember that there are some extremes that perpetrators of domestic abuse will go to post-separation. That is the time that is the most dangerous. Then what happened was the media got hold of it and they put a picture of the refuge in the paper. Um, not the address, but hey, if you live in an area, you can soon see where that might be. So we had to shut that refuge down um, and we got funding from, from the local authority to open another one. So that's just an example um, that I wanted to give to you. So in all of those 12 families, statutory agencies were aware um, of the abuse being perpetrated, but the connection hadn't been made um, to the harm for children are not always made. I'm not suggesting for a minute that the people in the room don't understand that there's a huge connection, but it wasn't made um, emphatically in those cases. Um, and in some cases, accessing and managing the risk to children was dealt with in a really inadequate way. And there's, there's an example there of a statutory service posting a letter to the non-abusive mother to explain about the risk to the children. Um, we should always remember that, especially when um, people are still living together where, where we suspect or we know of domestic abuse, not to do such things as send letters through the person. I think now we know about that. We know not to do that. We know it's dangerous. Um, three out of the, um, of, of the reports that were looked at highlighted the lack of direct social work with children. And I think Ray was, was saying about that, that due to all the cuts and austerity measures, we can no longer spend the amount of time that we would ideally like to spend with families. And I know when he was talking about that, he also highlighted the fact that 
um, about risk assessing that our world has been it, it, well is it, is actually managed by risk assessing now the, the one of the first things that we do when we come across families is risk assess so if the police go out to a domestic they do a risk assessment and then when they come into the statutory agencies they do another risk assessment and then when they go to a MARAC multi-agency risk assessment conference they may do another risk assessment and I want to talk about that a little bit later on and get people to think about maybe the productivity of that and how you could actually measure it because up to now there isn't any really true way of measuring the the outcomes um, of that way of working okay so interactions with families um, sometimes problematic information sharing I don't need to talk about information sharing. Every domestic homicide review that you read, every serious case review that you read, says the same thing around information sharing. Um, my take on it is I'd rather stand up in a, in, in a court or a, a, at a review somewhere and say why I shared information, actually, than rather say why I didn't share information. Um, it, it works. And again, you find in, in a lot of serious case reviews and domestic homicide reviews about silo working as well. So what generally happens is we get recommendations, we read them and everybody's on it. Let's get on it. Let's get our, you know, our house in order. And then after a while, you get what we call slippage and people go back and they forget and they start to work in their own little world again. Sorry about that. Uh, they start... Oh, they start to work in their own little world again. I've, um, yeah, there we go. And then the other thing that was flagged was unsupervised contact um, by statutory agencies where there could be um, a risk to um, children. One of the big things that came out was the professional understanding of coercion and domestic violence really. And the failure to see who holds the power it's really, really important because domestic abuse is extremely complicated and what you generally have in universal services is two people talking about it in two completely different ways and those two people are the perpetrator and the survivor. And we as professionals have to try and determine um, what's actually going on in that family. One of the best ways to do it is to find out who's actually holding the power in that relationship and I'll talk about that um, in, in a little while and then the other thing was there was a real focus on individual incidents when we know that domestic abuse is a pattern of incidents that happens over quite a long period of time um, and it can unfold and manifest in different ways but it isn't ever and I mean ever a one-off incident if it is it's not domestic abuse uh, perpetrators were quite rightly often prescribed, uh, described as controlling, but also they were using words like bully, bully and jealous and intimidating, which again isn't really explaining and, and, and um, understanding what domestic abuse is really about. Um, and there were many examples of coercive control before and after um, the incidents, the homicides. When I say there were many, many examples, it wasn't that they were shown and understood in the reports. It was that you could see when you read them that there was a lot of coercion involved in those relationships. The other thing was, I've already mentioned about parental separation uh, being a risk factor. We know that things escalate after separation, they don't reduce, and it's really important that we understand that. So nine out of the 12 perpetrators were known to have committed abuse after the separation. Um, we don't know about the other three because the information wasn't all that clear, but nine out of 12. Um, I actually don't think over 28 years I've ever supported or worked with a family where there hasn't been post-separation abuse of one form or another. Um, and one of the ways that that can be done is through the, through the court systems. So we, we, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and there was one case where a father was granted residential care of his children. Um, and this again was after making threats um, in the prison. So um, practice direction 12J is what it says. It's a direction and it's for child arrangements and contact orders. And it's purely around domestic violence and harms. So it sets out what judges and magistrates are required to do. Now, the required is in bold for a reason, because it's what they're required to do. 
Um, what it does now in the, in the practice direction is it defines domestic abuse as a coercive strategy um, and describes harm, but it also has some mandatory requirements for judges to determine whether children or non-abusive parents will actually be at risk of harm from a contact order. Now that is different because before this practice direction, there was a presumption made that um, people were, families had dual contact per separation. So there was that presumption made. And I'll even say further than that, there was with domestic abuse as well. So there were systems that perpetrators were taken through um, but in the end, the majority of fathers got contact with their children per separation with domestic abuse. There's only 3% currently now of fathers that do not get contact where there's domestic abuse. I don't know whether it will change with this practice direction. So there, the other change there was um, in the criminal courts, there has always been for domestic violence special measures that didn't apply in the family courts. They've now put that to the family courts as well. So in the family courts now, where there's any hearings, survivors of domestic abuse can ask for special measures to be put in place. So they can ask for all the things that were, that were given in a criminal court. So they can ask for screens, they can ask for links, they can ask for separate entrances, they can ask for all those things. What I will say up to now is that not all courts are set up for that, so they are working towards that. But quite rightly as well, because you'll understand the fear factor of going to court, for those of you that don't, when I've finished speaking. So in summary, where a risk assessment has actually concluded that a perpetrator poses a risk, to a child or, or the parent of that child, contact via supported contact centre or contact supported by a parent or relative is now deemed not appropriate. So what we were saying before is, oh, there's a risk here. So we'll have, what, what we'll do is, we'll, have, we'll, we'll use a contact centre to start with. Or, oh, actually, his mum or his sister or, or some, a member of the family has actually said, um, that they will that they will be present during contact. If it's now been proved where there's domestic violence, that is no longer deemed appropriate within practice direction um, 12J. And where the court actually considers it's not appropriate, it's then got to consider the safety and the benefit um, of of for the child to make an order, um, and that is direct or indirect order. So it's changed the balance quite a lot, and quite rightly so, because it's important, isn't it, that we look after and safeguard our children. Um, in particular, what they've said is that where domestic violence is proved, but the judge decides nonetheless to make an order, what he then has to do is explain why he believes that contact is safe. So when he gives an order when he knows there's domestic abuse, he has to now give his reasons why he believes or she believes that contact will be safe. So that's quite a big shift there. And hopefully, well, I'm guessing that there'll be quite a lot more fact finding going on um, if judges are having to write reports as to why they believe that contact is safe. I will say at this point that in Australia and I think it's New Zealand, where there's domestic abuse, their first port of call is no contact ever. So where there's domestic abuse, and that has come into the, into, into the lens, if you like, of the statutory services, the presumption is no contact. And then they work, quite rightly, with the fathers of those children um, in order for it to be safe for that contact to be made safe. So that's, yeah. So how will it work in practice? Um, it's like everything else. In order for anything to be effective, it goes beyond words on a page, doesn't it? So what we're saying is that everybody needs to have a real deep understanding into the risks posed to children, uh, pre and post separation where there's domestic abuse, and in particular, around coercive and controlling behavior. So that's really important. Um, the, to be fair, the uh, Judiciary College, 
have already put that in place. So all the family judges now, they get three um, days a year where they're specifically trained in coercive control. And significant, we know, isn't defined in the Children Act, so courts actually have to decide that themselves, what actually constitutes significant harm. So they're going to have to look at the facts much more clearly on each individual case. And for those of you, which I presume you do, hands up how many of you use the DASH risk assessment? Yeah, yeah, quite a lot, quite a lot. Then it was never, when, it, when that DASH risk assessment was developed, it was developed for adults, it wasn't developed for children. And what that speaks volumes really. Bernardo's have one that's specifically for children, but it's very, very busy. So I think we need to come um, and work and develop a, a risk assessment that fits children and young people uh, where there's domestic abuse, not just for domestic abuse, but because the Dash RIC um, is specifically for domestic abuse. We need to think about the questions on that risk assessment and think how they align to children, because it's quite important. All the questions on that Dash risk assessment come from previous homicides from the research from previous homicides to adults, not to children. So maybe we could, that could be our starting point. Right, um, I want to try and give the room an understanding into coercion and what it really is because over the years I've delivered domestic abuse training and it's been the same old, same old thing. And then in December 2015, we suddenly had a new piece of legislation and that new piece of legislation was about controlling and coercive behaviour. And it is unlawful now to commit controlling and coercive behaviour and it carries a five-year prison sentence. So we do need to be aware of what it really is. And what I will say to you is it's invisible. Coercion is invisible. So that's why many of us struggle with it. What we see as practitioners is the impact of coercion. So domestic violence was easy when we thought it was all physical because it was easy to see, wasn't it? But coercion isn't. Um, so I want to pose a question to you all and I want to ask you if, and some of you might have to think a lot deeper and longer than, than others in the room, including me, if you were going on a first date tonight, uh, so I want you all to imagine you're going on a first date tonight with whoever, and, and you've decided that you're going to go and have a meal somewhere and off you go and you sit in a restaurant and you have a meal and you're getting to know this person over the next couple of hours, a little bit about them and you come out of the restaurant and your new, the new person that you've just met says something political that you don't actually agree with. Politics are a little bit different here and, and you actually say, I, I'm sorry but... I don't know where you're coming from here and I have to say I absolutely don't agree with what you've just said and that person goes bang and smacks you in the face and says don't disagree with me don't ever disagree with me what could you do really easily what could you do quite easily you could walk away why could you walk away very easily pardon that's right, you've got no attachment. What, the, what might those attachments be that might have stopped you from walking away? Financial dependency. Financial dependency. Children. Children. Anything else? Your home. Your home. Yeah, that's right. All those things. You might actually be in love. So there's all those things, aren't there? And that's why we know and how we know that typically... Not always, but mostly actually, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, perpetrators of domestic abuse also know this. Because have you ever come across anyone that said, you know, from the day that I met this person, he was abusive and violent to me? No. So what they normally say is, this person's changed. This person isn't the person that I met and knew six months ago. So when I train judges, I say, hands up all those that you have read in an affidavit. I met this person 10 years ago, and over that and when I first met, met him, he was charming, he was everything that I wanted him to be. But over a period of time, he changed. 
that's how it works. So we call it conditioning. And it is a form of conditioning. It's something that Professor Evan Stark describes in his book on coercive control, if any of you have read it. And this conditioning takes many forms, but it's very subtle, extremely subtle. So what they do is, what we all do in new relationships, we'll start to align with each other. But when it's a healthy relationship, it's slightly different. So what they do is get to know people. And I always use an example of um, a university lecturer that I supported in, in Hull. And she was head of the psychology department. <coughs> and it was another lecturer, I won't say from where, but another lecturer in the university that she started seeing. <coughs> and she found out later, but didn't know at the time, that he was always going on the internet looking to see what lecture she had. He knew nothing about psychology but he was an intelligent person and he read up on her lectures and he used to give her a call and say, what have you got tomorrow then? Oh, I've got this lecture. <gasps> oh, yeah, I know all about that. In fact, a few months ago, I was reading this, reading that, and what she said was that was very attractive, and it is. If someone shows a liking for what we like, um, whether it be politics, history, whatever it is, it's very attractive, isn't it? And she was a single mum with two children. He was childless. And he told her that he'd always wanted children, that her children would be his children, that he would love them as if they were his own. So he was saying all the right things to her. And this can be many different things to many different people. So when you work with survivors in a therapeutic way, you hear different themes, but they're all the same. They're all saying, he'll say things like, oh, do you know what? When I first met him, he said he absolutely loved long hair. And then six months down the line, he couldn't stand it, and I ended up having it cut short. So it can be all different things. So gradually, this conditioning happens. And then once that person is there, falling in love, really loved spending time with this person, might even decide to move in together, that's when things can slightly change. There's manipulation used at the beginning as well. So now we all use manipulation in lots of different ways, whether it's encouraging our kids to eat peas or cabbage or whatever, or, but lots of different ways we use manipulation. And some people say to me, oh, we all use coercion. We don't, because manipulation and coercion is very different. Coercion attaches fear and it's instilled. Manipulation is different. There's no fear attached to it. But perpetrators are abuse use both so early on in a relationship they will use manipulation and they'll say things like oh don't wear that dress Go, why don't you put that, that that black number on that you had on last week it's 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 longer and it's a bit it's a bit higher up here because you're showing a bit now and do you know what i get a bit jealous uh, i've noticed when you wear dresses like that people look at you, well, other men look at you, and it makes me really jealous. I, I just adore you. I don't want other people looking at you. And at first, that can be quite complimentary. These are examples that have been told to me. Here's another example. A woman getting ready for bed, sat at a dressing table, taking her makeup off, and a partner says to her, when she's finished, just have a look in the mirror now. And she looks in the mirror, and she goes, what? What? And he goes, what do you see? And she goes, me? And he goes, I see a beautiful woman because you've just taken all that slap off your face. And you look amazing. You have got beautiful skin, beautiful eyes, and when you stick all that slap on your face, it completely changes you. And that woman told me, actually, she started wearing less makeup. She started looking in the mirror and thinking, actually, do you know what? I do like that own natural look a little bit more. And it, but eventually, what did she stop doing? Wearing makeup. She stopped wearing makeup. And that woman put weight on and was told, do you know what? When I met you a year ago, you were half the, you, you were half the woman that you are now. And I'm, I'm going off you a little bit. You, do you think you could just lose a bit of weight? And she went on a diet. I've worked with other women that have been told they're too thin, too ugly, too fat. So what happens over time is that manipulation starts to be coercion. And what happens very early on, some of you may have experienced this, because I don't think I've ever delivered 
anywhere, whether it be training or speaking, where there hasn't been someone in the room because it's so prevalent that's experienced domestic abuse. One of the first things is isolation. Manipulation first. Do we have to go to your mum's every Sunday? Well, I mean, we've just moved in with each other. Um, and I want us, us, you know, to spend time. I don't always want to be with your family. Um, this is about us. I love you. I love you. And that person will gradually stop. Um, do you have to go out with your friends? You've been out with your friends. We've been living together a month now, and you've been out with your friends every week. I don't get this. And what she doesn't tell you at that time is actually, while she's been out with her friends, he's sent her about 100 text messages. Where are you? What are you doing? FaceTime me, just so I can make sure where you are, actually. You said you'd be home at half ten. It's half ten now. Where are you? And gradually, that person actually stops going out because she gets fed up of being stalked, really, because that's what it is, and harassed. And then the violence might start. So, yeah, I'll be in by 11, and you're not in by 11, and you walk in at midnight, and bang, as you walk through the door. But there's always a reason given, because do you know what? It was your fault. That was your fault, because it's me that's been sat here worried to death over the last hour. You could have had your drink spiked, spiked you could have been raped, anything could have happened to you, and you've put me through this. You've put me through that. You deserve that to happen to you. So gradually, what happens is that person starts to think, this is me. I need, I need to conform a little bit more, I need, to, I need to change. So what survivors of domestic abuse do is they actually start to change their own behaviour and change themselves in order to fit into that perpetrator's world. And they often do it to a point where they don't know who they are anymore. They don't know who they are. So you get this conditioning, you get this perception that perpetrators have that actually it is all about them, it is their fault. And they start to think, actually, that they're too fat, they're too thin. They're a useless mother. That's a very common one. They're not capable of looking after the children. They can't drive because, you know what, they've got no sense of direction. They can't do anything, really. And actually, they've given their job up because they don't need to work. You don't need to work. We can manage. And that's whether that's on benefits or whether that's on, on a working, on a living wage. So they've done all this, and they're starting to believe it all. So what does that create? What does that create? Yeah, it creates dependency. Because in their head, they start to be completely dependent on that person. So when you work with women, and you ask them about the possibilities of leaving, when they started to think about leaving that relationship, they'll often say they couldn't, because in their head, they felt totally dependent on that person and they were believing everything that that person said. So if you feel that, you can't, that you're totally dependent on that person and you're living in that world of conformity all the time, day in and day out, what can't you do, even if you wanted to, in your head, what can't you do? You can't leave. You can't leave. And you get totally trapped. And what we say, and it's how women describe it, is that when you are trapped in that relationship, your options and choices disappear because you've not been allowed to have any for such a long time. And then we as professionals, we start to work with families and they go through the court systems. And what we're asking them to do almost immediately, make choices. We're starting to tell them about their world and the choices that they have to make. So we need to keep that. We need to keep that and hold it. This is someone called Lauren Laverne, who I think describes the process that I've just been talking about very eloquently. And what she says is it's like being in a box. And soon the box starts to shrink. And every time you touch the edges, there's an argument. So what she's really mean is, when you live with domestic abuse, you live in a world that you're conforming all the time. And it's when you start to step out a little bit and you're not conforming, that the box shrinks and shrinks and gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and you think everything is your fault. Professor Evan Stark describes this process um, and he says that there are four main categories to coercion. And those four main categories is the isolation, because usually by the time 
survivors and their children get, get in touch with the statutory services, they are often isolated from their friends and family. They're totally controlled and there is physical and violence and coercion happening at any one time, degrading, threats. So they're living with this continually, day in and day out. And those things cross over all the time. So when you do work and you look at those strategies, you'll find that many of them are happening all at once. And what we say is that even when survivors leave an abusive relationship, that perpetrator is still there. So he's the invisible perpetrator. And even when they're living with it, when they're not with him, he might be out at work, they're living with him in their head. So they're conforming day in and day out to those rules. And those rules can be spoken, but they can also be unspoken. They get to a point where they don't need to say anything anymore. There's just conformity all the time. And there's conformity with the children as well. So I'm going to come on to that in a minute. Professor Liz Kelly describes six stages of leaving an abusive relationship that lots of professionals don't understand because they don't understand how someone can leave an abusive relationship and then go back. And I'm sure there's many in this room that have worked with families where a, 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 a survivor has left an abusive relationship and she's gone back and she's left and she's gone back. And on average, it's between five and seven times. And that's because that survivor needs to come to a point where she truly recognises that actually it's not safe and that relationship isn't going to change. And that's for herself and the children. So what Liz Kelly says is that when you first enter into a relationship, which was what I described earlier, you manage the situation and you start to change and adapt into that perpetrator's world and you get distortion. You get totally distorted with your perspective of what it is and you start to blame yourself. So you're trying to change and adapt yourself all the time. And then there comes a time when you define it as abuse. That might be when one of you come in contact with that person and you sit and you give them some time and they tell you about their relationship and you say to them, what you've just described to me is abuse. It's an abusive relationship. Now, you might not believe me. You might not want to believe me. You might just take this away and think about it, but think about it. And some people think, I couldn't say that to someone. What I do know is, from lots of research, that survivors want to be asked about domestic abuse. Because when you ask the question, you are validating their experiences. You are saying, it's OK. But how you ask it is very, very important. Um, so once that happens, they start to reevaluate the relationship. And what this Kelly says is that this isn't linear. You don't just go straight up there. You go up and you go down. You go up and you go down. So you might reach the fact that you're evaluating your relationship, but you might think, oh, what a load of rubbish. That practitioner does not know what they're talking about. They don't live with him. They don't know him. And they might go all the way back down to managing the situation. But eventually, hopefully, they will end that relationship. Sometimes that's forced, and sometimes it's choice. And they will end that relationship, and sometimes they'll still go back, because they end the relationship. And I want to ask you, what do, what do, what do survivors of domestic abuse have to gain by ending a relationship? What do they gain? Think about this. What sort of things might they gain leaving in an abusive relationship and their children? Self-esteem. Can you shout out services? Self-esteem. Yeah. Self-esteem, yeah. The self-esteem will rise. Control. Control over what's happening. What was that? Reconnected with their families because they've been isolated, possibly friends. I, it's my safety. Safety, yeah. Safety. They'll, they'll hopefully be safe. Freedom. 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 Yeah. So a few examples there, aren't there? Yeah. So they might gain a new home, might they? They might gain gain financial independence. So it's just starting to think. What have we got to gain? Right. What have we got to lose? Shout a bit louder for me, because I'm. They're home. They have. Security. Security. Friendship what? group. 
Friendship group, I hope they've got a few more things than this. <laughs> Their children's security. Job. Money, yeah. A job, yeah, because they might have had to leave their job, but they might get another job. The person they still think they love. Love, yes. 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 Status. Status, yeah. Particularly cultural. So, yeah, they've got status. Yep, okay. So now what I want to say to ask you is, all those things that you said you had to gain, which is home, security, control, um, financial independence, will they get that straight away? Yeah. <coughs> no. In fact, it will take a long time, especially the self-esteem, yeah? What about what they lose? The home... They're, do they lose those immediately? Yeah. Yes, they do. So now I want you to picture, we've got a woman here. She's left, she's done everything that was asked of her, her to, to, to make her children safe, to make herself safe. So she's left and she has lost all those things that we've just talked about. She's not gaining anything immediately. So she's sat now in a refuge or a B&B which the local authority might have kindly paid for, which would be very good. What is she thinking? How is she feeling? Have I done the right thing? Have I done the right thing? Is she frightened? Mm -hmm. Extremely frightened. Is she vulnerable? Mm -hmm. Extremely vulnerable. So I want you to think about that the next time we're working with someone, quite rightly, to support them to leave a relationship, but to understand that the journey that they go on is a very long journey. And when it comes to control, it's amazing, yeah, when they get control back, but who takes over when they start to leave a relationship? We do, and including me, we all do, don't we? Control is something that we need to work, don't we, to give them back. And that's why it's really important to do it in a certain way, and that's what I'm coming to now. When it comes to post-separation, these are the most common calls to the police for assistance um, in, the, in the last 12 months. I think it was already said that um, Women's Aid came through to Cornwall. It's two years ago now, and we trained over 3,000 well, not just police officers, because there were some civilians as well, in the force on coercive control. And we always do an exercise with them, and we ask them what are the most common calls that they get that are domestic abuse associated. And these are the calls that they get. Because once a relationship finishes, this is what happens. This is coercive. They, they, they go through criminal damage, they get their cars, they get their slashed, they get their houses broken into, they get burgled, they get reported as a, a missing person, they have to actually, they get breaches of orders, threats of suicide, children not returned on time, stalking, surveillance and physical assaults. I've highlighted the ones that come from offenders that report to the police. So the offenders, the perpetrators, re usually report the survivor as a missing person. That's quite common. And the other thing that they do is they will ring up and say that they're suicidal. And all the red ones are from the victim. So these are ways in which they try and gain some control back. And these are things that survivors have to live with continually. And these are the calls that we've had from our National Domestic Violence Helpline, which we run. Um, in the last 12 months, uh, we take calls every day of the year, 24 hours a day. And these are the sorts of things that are coming through to the National Domestic Violence Helpline. So some of them are post-separation again, mediation. They, even though mediation is not recommended with domestic abuse, they're often still asked to go through mediation and they use what they call a shuttle process, where they have the perpetrator in one room and the survivor in another, and the mediator shuttles between the two rooms. It's still extremely scary to a survivor knowing that there is a perpetrator in that next room, their perpetrator, and even though they separate them on coming in and going out, they have to travel home and on that journey, they're worried continually as to whether or not they're being followed. So it's really, really important. And then the other one is contact being used to further abuse survivors, and that's directly or indirectly. So I want to come to the legislation. 
Um, hands up if any of you are really familiar with the coercive control legislation, if there's anybody that's really familiar. No, okay, okay. So it's section 76 of the Serious Crime Act, um, December 2015, and what it does is it highlights the coercive nature of an abusive relationship. We, Women's Aid and many others lobbied for this and we did it deliberately because domestic abuse was seen as a physical act rather than what, what people actually live through, sometimes for years and years. Um, and it's the coercive nature of a relationship that does the really long-term psychological damage and that's to children as well. Um, so it, it, that gap was closed from it and it enables a pattern of behaviour to be criminalised. So hopefully what will happen is when I've finished is that we'll all start thinking about how we use our records because it's very difficult to prove coercion um, and you can't do it on your own. So it's just not about the police and the CPS, it's about everybody and that's what I'm wanting to tell you. So. Coercive control, it's absolutely central to understand it if you're talking about domestic abuse. And it's best understood in the terms of an act, which is the coercive nature of it, and the effect on the victim. So it's no good just saying, oh, um, he used to turn up at work every lunchtime um, to see who she, uh, sorry, every evening to see who she walked out of work with. but to pick her up, he used to pick her up from work, but he was watching all the time. Yeah, that is part of a controlling nature of a relationship, but how did that affect her? Well, actually, she decided to work longer hours, or she decided... So it's about how it affects her as a person, all the different things that I'm going to describe. It's got to be repeated, and, and in the legislation, it's two or more times, so that's not exactly difficult, is it? Um, but it's got to have caused the victim fear that violence will be used against them on at least two occasions or it has had a substantial adverse effect on their day-to-day -day activities. So it doesn't have to be violent, it's about cause and effect. So it's really, really important that we grasp that. Those are some examples on the bottom there of how that might affect that person. So they may, they, they may change the way that they do things. Um, continually and it's really really important that we can grasp that and understand it even to someone you can you can actually um, see the physical effects sometimes so if you start and have a conversation with a survivor and she starts shaking and crying it's really important to actually record that someone's demeanor is really really important when it comes to coercion so these are just some of the types of behaviors associated with coercive control so we've got isolating from family and friends, yes, but how is that done and how does that affect that person and most importantly, the children in that family? So I want you to think about these now and how that might affect the children and young people that are living in that household. So when you have restrictions, those restrictions also appear, um, are associated with the children as well. And when children are seeing someone repeatedly being put down, when they're seeing someone repeatedly being told that they're a bad mother and they're worthless, you need to think about the effects. When they're being degraded and dehumanised, okay? Even criminal activities. I was saying earlier that um, there are quite a lot of women, actually, that are in prison that because of forced criminal activity where they've been in an abusive relationship. So that has an impact, doesn't it? If their mother goes to prison, they lose a parent, and the one that they're left with, actually, is the abusive partner. So those are all, all examples. There are many, 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 many more that you could use. And when it comes to children, if their mother is isolated from everyone, so are the children. And it's really, really important. If they're disempowering them, constraining them, they too themselves are being constrained. What they're, what, what they're given is a really insecure world to live in. Um, they live in a state of fear just as much as their mother does. Um, when we train practitioners who specifically work with children, we do an exercise called the room. And 
we put together a fictitious living room with typical controls, actually, and I say typical, that perpetrators will use um, in, in that household. Usually, what you get with um, the typology of a perpetrator is a real sense of ownership with that relationship and control. That's where that control comes from. And that ownership goes much further than the survivor. It's usually about everything in the house. So often there's one chair that that person sits in, there's one remote. So what we do is we set the rules to the different types of things in the room because they all usually have rules attached to them, even down to the newspaper. That person often has to be the first one to read the newspaper. So that's quite extreme, but then we get you to step in as a child. You've come home from school and this is your rules as well. And often, they have to clear up the mess before their dad comes home, if he's at work. Everything has to be in the right order. So imagine living in an insecure world like that all of the time. So it has a direct impact on them. These are uh, some examples here um, of what we call a power and control wheel. So typically, there are seven or eight strategies that abusers use that have a direct impact on children. So the perpetrators use institutions to threaten with, and they do that with the survivor and the children. They, we already know they isolate them and emotionally abuse them. They use economic abuse. If economic abuse is in place, which it is the majority of the time, again, that has a direct impact on the children in the family. They listen to the threats, and they listen to the intimidation and they, they observe the use of adult privilege in that household. And that has a direct impact on them because many abusive strategies are directed at their mother. Uh, they become protective um, and they also can become quite secretive. So it's really important when we work with children with domestic, that are experiencing domestic abuse that we do it in a very specific way. We can't do it in a generic way. It has to be in a way that understands the world in which they've been raised. So there are specific programs. Um, I'll say if you look on Women's Aid website, but there are other websites as well that you can look at that run specific programs around, one's called You and Me Mum, and that is about repairing that relationship that has been damaged and very damaged um, whilst they've been living with domestic abuse. There's another one um, that we use called Helping Hands which is you work with the children and the young people, and that is about their safety and them understanding uh, what's safe and what's not safe, and actually not being afraid to tell about their experiences and actually develop a support mechanism um, that they know, um, which, which is, is really good for them. Um, but as professionals, we have a, another little job on our hands here because there's someone called Professor Liz Kelly who actually did a big piece of research with survivors and came across these 10 domains and what she says is and this is quite true when you work with survivors you see it straight away is that what perpetrators do gradually and over a period of time they reduce a survivor's space for action so what that means is they make it very difficult for them to ask for support and they usually cut off. So they get cut off from their communities, their friends and their family, which stops them from accessing support. And another thing that's very common with perpetrators is they will escort or go with those people when they come in touch with statutory agencies. So even to go in with, to the A&E department if they've been injured, there they will be alongside. Um, any children's contact, there they will be again. So all these things are gradually cut off. Parenting, future plans. And what happens is it, get, it shrinks and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then when we get, they get in touch with the voluntary and statutory agencies, ideally what we should be doing is empowering them and opening those spaces up for them in a safe way. Now, it can be one or two things at a time, but it's really important to understand that usually all those things have been cut off from them and those domains need to be opened up gradually. That's just to remind us 
that there's actually statutory guidance in relation to the offence of coercive behaviour and what it says is that it should be dealt with as part of a child safeguarding public protection procedures which we all know um, and there's only one way to work with domestic violence and that is across all the agencies because it's it's like everybody was saying before us this is a multi-agency response that is required because it covers so many areas. So we need the voluntary and the statutory agencies to work together always with domestic abuse. And what often happens is we're doing something here, they're doing something there, and the twain never meet. And we need to try harder, and we're at fault as well, the voluntary agencies, are actually um, delivering services in a much more friendly way uh, multi-agency multi -agency way and involving the, the uh, voluntary agencies as well in the work that we do because they do and carry out critical work that often you can't do as statutory bodies. I'm not going to say it like that. Um, what I will say is that we definitely know that perpetrators actions harm children and we're in a risk-led um, world at the moment and unfortunately what that risk-led world does is not engage perpetrators of domestic abuse in the work as much as we should. So what we tend to do is engage the survivors um, and sometimes we put the responsibility for keeping safe on them. Um, we need to think about that a little bit more because the reason that children aren't safe and women aren't safe in abusive relationships is because of the perpetrator's actions. So we need to think about what that means and how we can work with that. It's really, really important. Um, the other thing is, in our records, we need to be really mindful about the language that we use. Uh, I often see, when I go around inspections, because I do inspections with police forces, Ofsted, etc., and you look at records and you often see this sort of language in records. The victim won't leave refuse support, let the perpetrator in, disengaged with the service. Um, I want you to think about this. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. I'm not saying that someone doesn't refuse to leave a relationship. But I think it would be great if we could put something like the victim is choosing not to, not to because she is, is choosing not to leave this relationship despite um, the discussions that we've had. Or the victim let the perpetrator in. That's another sort of classic. More often than not, they don't have a choice because that perpetrator's at the door, whether he's got an injunction or not, threatening that person. If you don't open this door, I'm going to smash it down. And I say to you, well, what would you do? Um, so yeah, they do. And sometimes they let them in because actually they're saying, I love you, I want to try again, please forgive me. So again, they let that person in. And it's about saying why they've done it, actually asking the question. Or even saying, I understand why you let this person in. Do you want to just tell me what, you know, what it was, what it was, that, the reason that you opened the door? Um, I can remember when I worked in Hull, we trained all the family judges. Um, and the Hull court was a combined court, so it did criminal um, as well. And... Uh, Shortly after we'd trained the judges, about a month after actually, I went to court with a woman whose partner had breached the injunction and she'd let him in. She'd let him in. It threatened, it threatened her and she'd let him in and it was back for an injunction. Now in those days, and you still come across it now, where judges will actually say, I'm revoking your injunction because you're not using it. After the training, this judge, I'm going to say his name because he, he and he won't mind, I know, because we're, we're very friendly, Judge Dowse, he asked the perpetrator to stand up, and he did, and he said, um, I've got a copy of your injunction here, and I'm, 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 I'm going to show you it, and whose name is on it? So he said, mine, and who else is? Hers, he said. So he said, yeah, and whose address is on it? Hers. So he said, yeah, and what does it say on that injunction? Um, and he said, it, it says that I haven't got to go. Yards, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I haven't got to go to the house. Mm. I haven't got to go within so many yards. Mm. I haven't got to call her. I haven't got to threaten her. I haven't got to harass her. So he said, and you're, you come here and tell me that she let you in. And he goes, yeah, I said, he went, you shouldn't have been there in the first place because that's what that paper's for. Yeah. So it completely 
overturned the way that they that they actually responded to breaches of injunction because we tend to put the onus on the survivor all the time you let him in rather than you went there when you shouldn't have gone there so it's about changing the way that we think about these about these things i'm just very quickly i'm conscious that i'm near to time um Two years ago, we supported um, Ofsted with their um, inspection of responses with children living with domestic violence. And um, I travelled the country, and what we did was we spoke to survivors. And we spoke to survivors about their experiences. Uh, and some were very positive, um, and quite rightly so, because there were some brilliant work people out there, and we're all here, and we all want to give good support. But I just wanted to share... Um, some of it with you. So it was a multi-agency response that was looked at. I specifically looked at um, children's social care and health, but there was police and probation involved in, in it as well. And what it called for was a greater focus on perpetrators. And I think that is what the message that I want to leave you with. Um, so on the inspection, what they saw was that work was often reactionary, so they were reacting to individual crises, um, which I fully understand. Ray spoke this morning about austerity and the drastic cuts that we've all had. We've had them the same in the voluntary sector. And what that means is that we, we, do, become, we do become reactionary rather than proactive because we have such low resources. Um, but the, in high-risk cases, they often saw immediate responses for agency to prioritise the safety and the adult victims. Um, some solutions, such as moving victims and children away from the perpetrators, but that actually isolated the children um, from friends, families and their school. So they were looking at what is the impact. It's a bit like practice direction 12G, actually. Actually, if I do this... What is the impact going to be um, instead of dealing with the perpetrator? So they're moving the children and the survivors and not dealing with the perpetrator. Um, crisis led was, was the focus and what was happening was as a result of that agencies were always looking at the right things and in particular not enough focus on the perpetrator. And so what they were suggesting was a pattern change. Um, in the worst cases there, agencies placed inappropriate attribution of responsibility on the mother to protect the children, when in fact it's the perpetrator that is, a, yeah, that is abusing. And the other thing was, there was a great emphasis on the end of the relationship being as considered as reducing harm to the children, when in fact we all know that it escalates. I mean, I lived in a world, and I don't know whether it still happens now because I don't, I'm not a practitioner anymore, but when I managed refuge services, if I had a fiver for every time someone rang me from social care and said, oh, well, we're going to close the case now because they're in your refuge, um, I could, I'd be a multimillionaireess. I don't know how much that happens now. It shouldn't happen because it is the most... They, it should be the opposite, absolutely, yeah. <coughs> So, um, what they were saying is there needs to be a shift, um, but they also said that there was some really good practice, um, but people were sort of working in silos, and again, that message about a systematic focus needing to be put on perpetrators' behaviours, and I can't stress that enough. Um, they were really positive about the range of services um, that there were, local partnerships, um, and that they were saying that because of this focus on safety and risk assessing, that often they were so focused about going along that path that they were missing, missing other means, if you like, of protective factors, which are really, really important. So what they were saying is focus on the perpetrator. Um, there was a, a really big noticeable absence um, of attention that was given to the perpetrator. Uh, a lack of clarity, and victims themselves could, um, could have appeared to be manipulative and secretive, but they actually weren't. They were, they were protecting in, in very difficult, very difficult um, circumstances, but there was quite a lot of victim blaming, and that isn't to say that we're victim blaming. It's very frustrating, extremely frustrating, when you feel you've gone down so far with a family and you're just getting there, and then things, things happen um, 
but we must try not to do this. When it comes to coercive control, um, and they looked at that specifically, what they were saying was that things like written agreements that place the responsibility on the survivor um, was not a good idea. And even more than that, they looked at them quite in depth and they said that there was a huge focus on written agreements. What you get often with written agreements, I'm not saying you should never use them, I'm not doing that, but what you do get is compliance. So you'll have a written agreement, and if it says something like, the victim will not continue a relationship, and she will not allow him in the house, you're actually setting them up to fail, in one sense. And it's about doing it with them, and not to them. So in a sense, what, well, what they said was that for all there was an extensive use actually of written agreements, that they were surprisingly ineffective. So what I'm asking you is, think about it and at least have a look to see what the outcomes have been from those written agreements, because there are different ways of doing things other than written agreements that, that create a partnership really. Um, Accepted practice in tackling social problems is to prevent, protect and repair and that is what this report was all about. And what they were saying is that there's lots of work being done that's brilliant and, and I know it and I see it all the time but that we need to go a little bit further with that. And they suggested that there needs actually to be a, a public service message across that focuses on the needs of uh, perpetrators and when I say the needs of perpetrators I don't mean what they need I mean that focuses on what they need as well so we work with perpetrators in our in our sector we work with male victims as well you can't just focus on one thing you have to focus on them all um, if we don't do work with perpetrators they'll just move on to the next victim and that's what happens so we do need to focus on perpetrators and I don't know what you have here in Cornwall when it comes to perpetrators programs but yeah. So the whole conclusion was that what we have here is an incident-led response. It's short term, it's focused on immediate incidents and that actually we should be changing the way that we think about it and we should be saying, instead of saying why doesn't she leave, we should be saying why doesn't he stop. And if we do that, if we create that shift, I think we'll get a lot further than we are doing um, at the moment. Um, I just want to end by saying that current processes are risk-led um, and what that does is leave those that are deemed as medium and low risk um, having to sort of prove the need for a service and we know it doesn't work actually. If you look at domestic homicide reviews, a lot of the, a lot of the domestic homicides um, that have taken place, some of them have never been in touch with statutory services and they've not been deemed as high risk either. So we do need to think about this. Risk is really, really important. I'm not saying it isn't. And we do need to know that and we need to establish that. But sometimes we need to look at the processes that we've got in place, especially the multi-agency processes, and start to think, is this really working? Are we actually getting what we want out of these multi-agency meetings? And if we're not, do we need to change them slightly? Yes, they do need to be multi-agency meetings. But what are we focusing on and how do we need to shift in order to get better outcomes for women and children? Thank you.